Hi, I'm Art Horwich. I want to talk to you about chaperonin and chaperone assisted protein folding, uh, a cellular mechanism that uh, we've been working on for many years. Um, and I want to give you um, a sort of history of how this field came about. I want to talk about the two main chaperone families that have been fairly well studied, the HSP60 and HSP70 families. And then I want to spend a little bit of time surveying several other chaperone families that have great importance in the cell as well. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, a stress detection system because chaperones are sort of effectors of protein folding in the cell. Uh, and they, uh, in particular, help the cell under stress conditions. And so how is the stress transmitted such that one makes more of these effector proteins to help the cell in dire, uh, when it's in dire straits? And finally, I just want to comment on the relation or increasing relation of molecular chaperones and protein misfolding uh, in disease, particularly neurodegenerative disease. So um, by the way of history, um, I should start by indicating that we're talking about the uh, final step of information transfer in the cell. So there have been machines that have been identified decades ago and characterized more recently in great detail that are involved with uh, producing RNA from uh, encoding DNA, uh, with translating RNA at ribosomes to produce polypeptide chains. Uh, but until recently, less was known about what happened to newly uh, uh, um, made polypeptide chains uh, leaving the ribosome. Um, and I want to give you some of the background to that. So for those unfamiliar, polypeptide chains are composed of strings of 20 different amino acids. And the particular sequences of amino acids uh, dictate ultimately a final folded structure that um, is a unique and relatively stable structure uh, that is involved uh, in carrying out cellular functions. So for example, um, enzymes, cytoskeletal components, channels, hormones, receptors, and a, a large variety of the effectors in our cells are uh, uniquely folded polypeptide chains that carry out biological activities. So the real granddaddy experiment in this, related to this last step of information transfer, protein folding, was carried out in the late 1950s uh, by Anfinson and his coworkers. Um, uh, it, it, a remarkable experiment um, in which they started with an enzyme, a ribonuclease, uh, a native folded structure of 100 odd amino acids with a bunch of disulfide bonds in it, completely unfolded the protein in urea and reductant, uh, and then asked whether the uh, essentially random coil chain could find its way back to the native state when they removed the uh, um, uh, denaturant and reductant. And remarkably, the protein fairly efficiently refolded and resumed its enzymatic activity. Um, so this suggested that um, all of the information uh, to properly fold a polypeptide chain is contained in its primary amino acid sequence, um, in addition to which when it reaches the native state, it's at some sort of an energetic minimum, a, a sort of stable minimum. Uh, so this was an astonishing experiment. I remember being an undergrad at Brown University at that point and uh, hearing in 1972 that the Nobel Prize was being conferred for this experiment and thought it was really one of the most indelibly beautiful experiments I'd ever heard of. Uh, I never thought I would have anything more to, to do with protein folding. Uh, it's really a bit serendipitous that I should ever wind up having something to do with this. Um, so one can think of Anfinson's experiment in terms of protein folding on what is called a smooth energy landscape. So uh, at the top of this energy landscape are a host of uh, random coil conformations represented by D1 and D2 here. There's a large number of weakly structured conformers um, with a lot of uh, entropy and very little in the way of stabilizing contacts. But as the polypeptide chain folds, it gains stabilizing um, contacts. There are fewer conformations, uh, and it's going down the energy landscape effectively, sort of like a ski slope. 
and um, the polypeptide ultimately winds up at the bottom of this slope in the native state, a unique sort of energetic minimum. Uh, and so this is, is sort of an energetic explanation of the Anfinson experiment. But after Anfinson's great experiment, what was noticed was that a lot of polypeptide chains could not fold, uh, refold spontaneously uh, in a test tube following um, dilution from denaturant. They, they tended to wind up in misfolded aggregates in white material that could be sedimented to the bottom of a tube. Furthermore, in the biotech industry, when people went to try to express their favorite mammalian protein in E. coli, they often wound up with the same kind of result, misfolded aggregated inclusions inside of the bacterial cell, usually at its terminal end, case of E. coli. Uh, and so this raised questions as to whether uh, proteins could be having kinetic difficulties in cells. That is, Anfinson's principles were uh, certainly uh, operative that the primary amino acid sequence was directing a, a fold to an energetic minimum, but things could go wrong under cellular conditions of relatively high temperature and very high uh, local solute concentration. And the energetic interpretation of that kind of, of situation is that in the cell, one has a rugged energy landscape where the folding polypeptide chain can get stuck. It can get kinetically trapped behind one of these energy barriers. And on the time scale of what's needed in the cell, the protein effectively never reaches the native state and has to be degraded or fails to, or winds up in an aggregate. Uh, and thus, um, there was, it seemed that there was uh, a need for kinetic assistance uh, inside cells. Well, there was a class of proteins uh, identified independently of all the things I've been telling you about uh, in the mid to late 70s called heat shock proteins. Uh, and these are proteins that uh, under cellular stress conditions, particularly thermal stress, uh, were highly transcribed and translated and became abundant proteins in the cell. And they were classified according to their molecular mass the HSP90 proteins of roughly 90 kD size, the HSP70 proteins, and for example, small heat shock proteins of roughly 20 kD size. And, however, the function of heat shock proteins remained really quite unclear. Uh, there were postulates that they had something to do with glucose metabolism, that they had something to do with stabilizing nucleic acids, and there were really a myriad of models for what they might be doing. Um, the answer as to what they might be doing really came from Hugh Pelham working uh, at the LMB. Uh, he noticed that the abundant heat shock protein called heat shock protein 70 or 70 kD molecular mass, uh, when supplied in uh, more significant amounts by uh, transfection to cells that were undergoing heat stress, could accelerate the recovery of nuclear morphology after heat shock. And this started out as sort of a vague idea that maybe other proteins were being helped or maybe other nucleic acids were being helped to maintain their active forms under stress conditions. But Pelham very quickly reduced this to the level of protein-protein interactions uh, with a variety of in vitro experiments carried out with isolated uh, nucleoli. This is taken from a, 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 a cell new, um, uh, commentary in 1986. Uh, he generated a model that suggested that in the presence of ATP, HSP70 could bind to incipiently aggregating proteins and through the action of hydrolysis, pull them effectively apart from each other uh, and now release itself in the presence of ADP from these dissociated proteins. It could then go through another cycle in which it acquired ATP again, and multiple rounds would, would lead to uh, disaggregation. That's not quite exactly how HSP-70s uh, work, but he came awfully close to a correct model, even at that early point in time. Really a remarkable synthesis. Uh, and so this defined now that heat shock proteins had something to do with protein conformation and with protecting the cell from uh, protein aggregation. The question remained open, however, as to whether uh, such uh, components as these so-called chaperones could have any role in de novo protein folding under normal conditions. It seems, and it's been quoted, that nature leaves nothing to chance, and that seems to be the case with de novo protein folding as well.
So I have to spend just a minute to tell you about the system that we were working on because it's a little bit uh, off the beaten track, but we were busy studying how proteins enter mitochondria. So it turns out that most of the proteins of mitochondria are nuclear encoded uh, and are synthesized on cytosolic polyribosomes. Um, and then following synthesis on the ribosome, an N-terminal uh, ticketing peptide, a targeting peptide, directs the protein to, specifically to receptors on the mitochondrial surface. And the, the recognized protein is then translocated through the mitochondrial membranes. And there was a very important experiment published by Gottfried Schatz and his co-workers in 1986 that showed for, that for newly made mitochondrial proteins to transit the mitochondrial membranes, they had to be unfolded. Um, this was demonstrated using uh, essentially a dihydrofolate reductase protein that had never seen mitochondria. It had a signal peptide attached to it, and it could go into mitochondria as long as you didn't force the DHFR to be folded. So for example, if you supplied a methotrexate ligand, the protein couldn't get into mitochondria. If you took that ligand away, now the protein went into mitochondria. A very elegant set of experiments. But the question that we were in a position to address was what happens on the other side of the mitochondrial membranes? Do proteins fold, refold spontaneously to reach their native active form? Or could there be some form of machinery necessary to assist the refolding of an imported protein? And so uh, we carried out um, a, a set of experiments on a yeast library that was a conditional lethal yeast library that we had generated uh, in which uh, a, a bank of temperature sensitive lethal yeast mutants was used and each mutant was screened individually to ask whether an imported mitochondrial protein could reach its biologically active form. And the reporter used for our uh, screen was this uh, mitochondrial matrix protein uh, of um, liver origin, ornithine transcarbamylase, a homotrimeric uh, protein of the urea cycle. Uh, it turns out that yeast do not have an OTC in mitochondria, and we had ob ablated the OTC that is in, uh, a cytosolically localized version in yeast. Um, the arch, uh, deleting the ARCH3 gene. And so we could measure essentially the presence of OTC activity as reflecting intactness uh, in our temperature sensitive mutants of the entire pathway presumably of import through the membranes, cleavage of a signal peptide, and then folding and homotrimerization of OTC uh, to its native state. Uh, and so um, initial t uh, temperature sensitive mutants that we analyzed that were defective in production of OTC enzymatic activity uh, turned out to affect uh, the uh, cleavage of its signal peptide. And so these were multiple subunits of a matrix processing peptidase uh, that's an essential protein that cleaves the leader peptides off of imported mitochondrial proteins. And one night, it occurred to us that maybe there could be such a mutant as would affect, in fact, the folding of newly imported OTC subunits uh, imported into the matrix space. And no sooner did we look for such a mutant than we actually found one. We didn't quite, quite know what to make of it. It seemed heretical that there would be a machinery that assists the folding of newly made proteins or newly translocated proteins in this case. So we started to look at endogenous yeast proteins, uh, the F1 beta subunit of the ATPase here that sits in the, uh, the stalk uh, of the ATPase. Uh, and is involved with energy transduction, uh, was found imported into the mitochondrial matrix, but non-assembled and rather aggregated in the matrix compartment. And other proteins were affected as well. We couldn't really make heads or tails of this until we received a phone call from Ulrich Hartle and Walter Neupert, who said, we understand you're studying some mitochondrial mutants. Uh, and what happened, in the long and the short of it is, that they helped us further characterize this particular mutant. Uh, and indeed, in their hands, proteins were imported completely into the mitochondrial matrix compartment where they failed to reach their native active form. Uh, and one protein in particular was of interest, this iron sulfur protein, excuse me, right here, 
is a monomeric protein that is imported into the mitochondrial matrix and undergoes several cleavage events before it winds up in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And in this particular mutant, none of the cleavage events occurred. The protein was found in a misfolded aggregated state. So this suggested that monomeric proteins, not just all these oligomeric assembled proteins, were affected, and that suggested that it was polypeptide chain folding that was affected, not so much the subsequent event of oligomeric protein assembly. And Ulrich carried out uh, an elegant in vitro experiment with Joachim Osterman, showing that if you deliver dihydrofolate reductase to the mitochondrial matrix, uh, it became associated with a large assembly and in fact, in our mutant as well, DHFR could not reach uh, the native state. Uh, and so what, what was this assembly? What did any of this have to, how did this work? Uh, so we rescued our mutant with a, um, a, a, a bank of uh, yeast clones and the clone that rescued encoded a mildly heat inducible protein that had been recognized a year beforehand uh, by Richard Hallberg out in Iowa. He was busy sequencing the yeast version. He'd originally identified a tetrahymena version. We called him up and asked him, does the sequence of this gene that rescues our mutant match the sequence of HS, uh, this heat shock protein that you're studying? And he said, yes, indeed. We could match this, uh, their sequences base for base. And so collectively, we dubbed this protein heat shock protein 60. But it's a bit of a misnomer because this component is essential under all conditions. Uh, it's crucial for folding under all conditions. And so that suggests that indeed protein folding requires kinetic assistance, not just under uh, heat shock conditions, but under normal conditions of growth. So the uh, reaction uh, carried out by this assembly uh, was reconstituted in, in a test tube within a year of the time of our original observation. Uh, this was initially carried out by George Lorimer and his co-workers at DuPont, uh, and then by Ulrich uh, and uh, Jorg Martin, uh, with us sort of uh, as uh, bystanders uh, in, in Munich. Um, and the reaction could really be broken down into uh, two steps. In the first step, uh, a chaperone and ring assembly, here the bacterial homologue of HSP60, called GROW-EL, becomes complexed with a non-native protein that, for example, is diluted from denaturant. Uh, and this forms a binary complex in which the non-native polypeptide, as we could show by electron microscopy, both Hartle and Baumeister and our own group with Joe Wall, the po non-native polypeptide is bound in a hole, in a central hole in the ring assembly. Uh, then, uh, and in, in that context, the non-native polypeptide has no enzymatic activity, um, but is stabilized against aggregation. Uh, in a second step, one could add co-chaperonin, uh, another ring assembly, also a seven-membered ring of 10KD subunits called GROW-ES, along with hydrolyzable ATP, and something would happen. A remarkable thing would happen, in fact. The non-native polypeptide would be released in its native form uh, from the assembly over a period of a few minutes. Uh, and so understanding this reaction really took us a good 15 or so years to, to work out in a series of experiments carried out by our group, uh, Ulrich's group, George Lorimer's group, and many other groups worldwide. Uh, uh, one of the things that we approached was to try to get a decent uh, x-ray structure of GROW-EL as a, as a sort of guide to structure studies. Uh, and so after four years' work, we were able to finally generate from a variant uh, version of GROW-EL uh, with two benign mutations in it, decent crystals of the GROW-EL chaperone. And it's, so here you see the double ring assembly that had been seen in the electron microscope. Uh, each of the subunits uh, is divided into three domains, an equatorial domain, uh, and these collectively make the waistline of the cylinder and are sort of a stable base to the cylinder. Uh, you see next to it a hinge-like intermediate domain that is connected to the business end of the machine, these so-called apical domains. So the apical domains on their inside aspect have hydrophobic surfaces that bind a non-native polypeptide uh, through its own uh, exposure of hydrophobic surfaces. Uh, and then um, in a subsequent step, these hinges open 
and, and help to form an encapsulated chamber, as I'll show you in the next uh, couple slides, which is where folding takes place. So here's the polypeptide binding surface. It's a hydrophobic surface. It took us a bit of a while to figure out that this must be the surface, but one morning we came into the lab and we had mutated all these uh, hydrophobics that we saw facing the central cavity of Groyel, and all of the mutants that we made were unable to support uh, viability. Groyel is essential for cell viability. Uh, and we very quickly purified all of these individual mutants and could show in vitro that changing any one of these residues, which of course changes seven residues around a Groyel ring to a hydrophilic character, abolishes polypeptide binding. Uh, and so in further experiments, we could show uh, genetically, uh, but I won't show that to you here, that you needed three or four consecutive binding proficient apical domains in order to bind a polypeptide. More dramatically, in recent uh, EM experiments, it's been possible to directly observe a non-native polypeptide bound uh, inside a GROEL ring. And the non-native protein associates with three or four consecutive uh, apical domains. Uh, and so it's this hydrophobic interaction that captures non-native polypeptides uh, and that is specific for non-native polypeptides because native uh, structures have those hydrophobic surfaces buried to the interior. Uh, and it is that binding that prevents the non-native polypeptide from irreversible uh, misfolding and uh, multimolecular aggregation. So in the second part of the reaction, uh, and uh, unique to the chaperonins, is the ATP-driven release of polypeptide into a now encapsulated chamber. So this is GROES bound to a GROEL ring. And you see that this little sort of lid-like structure, uh, seven-fold symmetric, just like the Groyel ring to which it's binding, uh, sends down little loops that contact uh, the very same hydrophobic binding surface that was used to bind non-native polypeptide. And so um, a, a, an isoleucine, valine leucine hydrophobic edge in those loops directly interacts with the hydrophobic surface that was used to bind polypeptide. So what's happened here is ATP has driven an opening motion and allowed GROES to associate with a GROEL ring. And now the non-native polypeptide, because there's no longer any exposed hydrophobic surface, is ejected into this chamber where it folds in solitary confinement. And so here is a sort of um, underpinning to how this whole reaction works. Uh, an open GROEL ring, as shown by this trans ring on the bottom, uh, has this hydrophobic surface, all shown here in yellow. These are all hydrophobic side chains pointing into the cavity. These are the surfaces that can capture a non-native polypeptide. But when GROES binds to a so-called cis ring, uh, that is the ring associated with GROES, the wall character changes entirely because the, the um, uh, subunit has undergone, or the apical domains of the subunit, have undergone an elevation and a clockwise twist. So all the hydrophobic surface is essentially removed from facing the cavity. The polypeptide is stripped off into this hydrophilic cha uh, folding chamber. So all this blue that you see is electrostatic residues mainly, uh, a very large number of both um, uh, positives and, and uh, acidic residues uh, line this cavity with a slight excess of acidic residues. And so the polypeptide folds in this confined space. Uh, we believe that it folds in a, essentially a passive way as if it were in an infinite sea of solvent. Whether the uh, cavity walls really play any role in supervising this reaction, our own data would support uh, th that's unlikely. But there have been experiments that have suggested that perhaps there are some interactions. So all in all, this cycle is driven by ATP binding and hydrolysis. And so to just very quickly summarize, a non-native polypeptide comes into what is essentially an ATP bound ring. That's because ATP binds 10 to 100 fold faster to an open ring than non-native polypeptide. Uh, it then binds on the hydrophobic surfaces. In the second step, GROES becomes bound. So GROES binding to a ring requires ATP binding to that ring, to the seven sites of uh, equatorial sites in that ring. And so that produces this encapsulation reaction that I've just described. So the apical domains 
of that ring and its intermediate domains as well undergo rigid body movements that produce this domed folding chamber that's in an ATP bound state for roughly 10 seconds. This is the longest step of the reaction cycle, which is effectively the duty cycle of the machine. At the end of 10 seconds, a hydrolysis event uh, occurs and now this ADP complex is ready to be discharged. It has a brief half-life of a little under a second and the way the rings operate is they're anti-cooperative with, with, with respect to each other such that once ATP is hydrolyzed in this ring that gates the entry of ATP into the opposite ring. So here you see ATP entering this ring and it sends an allosteric signal that ejects all the ligands off of what was the folding active ring. So they all leave. But at the same time that it has, ATP arrives here, polypeptide comes and so does grow yes. And now ultimately this uh, becomes the folding active ring. Uh, and this ring has now been discharged and becomes inactive. So the machine oscillates back and forth with in respect to using its rings as folding active with ATP simultaneously ejecting the ligands on what had been a folding active ring and simultaneously nucleating the, uh, pres the production of a new uh, cis ternary complex in which polypeptide in the presence of ATP becomes encapsulated by GROES and this becomes a new folding active cis ternary complex. So one message, a major message that came from the study of chaperonins and the ability to look at them structurally concerns the nature of molecular chaperones in general. They can recognize hundreds of different non-native proteins. Um, what's the feature that's shared by all of them? Well, as the field has progressed, it seems like it's exposure of hydrophobic surfaces in non-native polypeptides. So just to sort of reiterate, um, a folded protein contains a greasy hydrophobic core and exposes its, uh, as shown here in blue, its electrostatic and electrophilic surfaces to the water solvent. But under cellular conditions, high relatively high temperature, high concentration of proteins, sometimes stress reactions, the, non -nat the native polypeptide can become uh, misfolded and it now exposes that uh, hydrophobic core to the solvent and as a result of that the efficient thing that's going to happen is protein aggregation where these hydrophobic surfaces get together as a multi-molecular aggregate. Actually these are all entropic reactions that have to do with uh, water binding to particular surfaces and avoiding others. Uh, but in, to make a long story short the idea of molecular chaperones is to recognize such exposed hydrophobic surfaces with the proffered hydrophobic surfaces of the respective molecular chaperone. And so it's these hydrophobic contacts between chaperone and non-native polypeptide that effectively prevent the non-native protein from aggregating. And so the difference comes with respect to topologies. The chaperonins provide a uh, a, a cavity in which a collapsed protein exposing hydrophobic surface can interact with the cavity walls. But you can imagine lots of other geometries for exposure of hydrophobic surfaces. And the other major family of molecular chaperones, the HSP70 class family, operates in exactly a different way. So HSP70, and here you're looking at the peptide binding domain solved by Wayne Hendrickson and his co-workers in 1996 structurally with a peptide uh, essentially uh, associated with the peptide binding domain. This is a pancake shaped structure where the peptide shown here in blue is essentially piercing the pancake and it through an archway formed by loops that surround that peptide that is uh, composed of hydrophobic residues. And so the peptide sequence here, NRLLLTG, uh, is interacting with that archway through the three leucines. Um, they're interacting with this phenylalanine, for example, here, with an alanine that's over here, and with the methionine that lies just above it. And so those leucines are being stabilized uh, and per, in an, essentially a short stretch of polypeptide chain by this hydrophobic arch in HSP70. Well, in the context of polypeptide chains, intact polypeptide chains, 
we can think of HSP70 binding as sort of a beads on a string type of thing. And in fact, we can think of a chaperone pathway as occurring where HSP70 class proteins as shown in studies of both mitochondria and for example, in the cytosol of both bacteria and eukaryotes interact with newly made or newly translocating polypeptides while they're in relatively extended conformations that have to go through membranes or leave the ribosome, they interact with short stretches of hydrophobic uh, polypeptide chain and protect them from prematurely aggregating or misfolding. Uh, and that happens in the case of mitochondrial protein import that I've talked about earlier uh, on both sides of the membrane. So an HSP70 in the cytosol stabilizes the protein against aggregation uh, before it contacts the receptor system in the outer membrane. And there's also likewise on the inside of the mitochondria in the matrix compartment, an HSP70 that binds the newly entering chain and stabilizes it. And now in the case of this import pathway, ultimately if a released polypeptide released from this HSP70 can't spontaneously fold, it's going to be taken up by the HSP60 chaperonin system in a collapsed conformation for a final folding step. And likewise in the cytosol, and I should point out that these are really um, early experiments that took place um, in the labs of Betty Craig, uh, Klaus Fanner, uh, but Ulrich reconstituted a lot of this in vitro to really ram home the point that there could be sequential transfer between these chaperone systems uh, in a 1992 paper with Tomas Langer. Uh, in any case, in the um, in the cytosol, one can have the same sort of sequence of events, for example, in the bacterial cytosol, where HSP70s are binding to extended chains, leaving ribosomes, and a final folding step where it's required for uh, several hundred proteins by the chaperonin system is then subsequently carried out. So finally, let me say just a little bit about HSP70 system itself. Um, I, I've shown you this particular structure, which essentially is the peptide binding domain with a peptide bound. Uh, in fact, HSP70s also contain a nucleotide binding domain. So just like uh, the chaperonins, they use ATP binding and hydrolysis to cycle uh, non-native proteins on and off of the chaperone. So in the case of this uh, peptide-bound version of uh, HSP70, or the bacterial version called DNAK, the polypeptide is stably bound when the chaperone is in an ADP-bound state. Uh, and that's a fairly safe, stable state, necessitating that one, if one ever wants to release the polypeptide, one has to get the nucleotide out of the uh, nucleotide, the N-terminal nucleotide binding domain. And so an exchange factor in the case of bacteria called GRPE is used, and it effectively pulls the nucleotide uh, pocket apart and allows the ADP to depart. Uh, enabling ATP to then enter that pocket. And as it does so, it then mediates an allosteric crosstalk to the peptide binding domain and releases the polypeptide as well as GRPE at the same time. So now a polypeptide released from uh, an HSP70 could spontaneously fold on its own, could be transferred to Groyel, could be transferred to another chaperone, or could go through another round of attempted folding using the DNAK HSP70 system. So the non-native polypeptide in many cases will be bound by what's called a J protein. In the case of bacteria, the DNA J protein uh, is a chaperone in and of itself that has a uh, an N-terminal domain that's capable of associating with HSP70s and a C-terminal domain that has its own peptide binding properties that can also see short uh, hydrophobic stretches of uh, non-native polypeptide. And so frequently J proteins are found to recruit non-native proteins two K proteins, two HSP70 proteins. So the J N-terminal domain associates with the nucleotide binding domain of DNAK and accelerates ATP hydrolysis to produce this locked-in state in which the proffered polypeptide that's being transferred from a J to an HSP70 will be locked in. And so that's effectively a cycle of um, 
folding and release as carried out by this system. Now we don't quite, quite have as much uh, crystallographic architecture for this system. Um, there are um, a, a number of structures of the individual domains and we believe that in the ADP bound state from NMR data, these two domains function almost completely independently of each other. It's when they're in the presence of ATP that they come together and they're now the first, uh, a first structure is emerging, uh, it's still as yet unpublished, but it gives some idea of how the architecture of these domains changes and how they associate with each other uh, in the presence of ATP. We still have to understand how J proteins uh, fully associate and what they look like when they're fully associating and proffering a protein to an HSP70. So um, to summarize what I've been telling you about so far, I've talked about the HSP60 chaperonin system, the ring assemblies, uh, and the HSP70s that um, um, uh, deal with extended polypeptide chains and hydro short hydrophobic segments. Uh, and the point I want to make here is if you consider a eukaryotic cell and where these particular components are present, you find the HSP70s at the ribosome dealing with newly translated proteins. You find them are in and around membranes where they're helping things get across the mitochondrial membranes, but likewise across the ER membrane. And you find chaperonins not only in the um, homologous to bacteria, the mitochondrial matrix space where our original HSP60 studies were carried out, but there's also a cytosolic, uh, eukaryotic cytosolic chaperonin called the TCP1 or TRIC complex that's essential for mediating the folding of actin and tubulin and beta propeller proteins and a number of other proteins um, uh, in the uh, eukaryotic cytosol. And so again, it would be involved with final folding of these kinds of components. Uh, and it's an essential complex composed of eight different subunits per ring, which uh, has so far uh, led to a, a relatively more difficult access to exactly how it works, whether it specific subunits bind specific uh, segments of specific non-native polypeptides or not remains so, sort of an open question. This also has a built-in lid structure compared to the detachable lids of the HSP60s that I uh, told you about. Uh, and so it's a little bit different system that's under intensive study at this point. Now I'm going to talk subsequently, you're talking about the ER system where the presence of glycans added to newly uh, translocated proteins and the presence of disulfide bond formation uh, play a key role in protein folding. There is no chaperone in, in, inside of the ER. It's a somewhat different system that deserves some attention here. And I also want to talk about the HSP90 class proteins, which uh, increasingly may have some uh, involvement uh, since they're involved with um, the final folding of uh, nuclear receptors and various kinases uh, with um, uh, uh, cell growth control and with potential therapies for uh, malignant disease. So I'm going to stop there and we'll continue with the second portion in a moment.